uh, I was born at Warren Gezeda, and uh, about it'll be 74 years ago on the Murrumbidgee. My mother taught us a lot, and, and she was of the Murray River tribe. My two sisters were born on the Murray River, and two of us were born on the Murrumbidgee. But we used to love to get with the old people. It was out on a summer night especially, and they'd sing in the old language, and with the teachers to do the corroboree. Our people were uh, like one big family. Yes, we had quite a good social life. There used to be the clay pan dances, and uh, one event that was especially looked forward to was the visited the Burrabadi people, that was the mission at Coonabarabin. They used to come down each year and uh, supply half the, half the concert. There was a violin player from Coonabarabin, and uh, we had our violin player. We'd all join in and form a sort of band. We had a pretty, pretty good life there. There was plenty to eat. We were not dependent on the government for food or anything. We were totally independent of that type of help. Throughout the 1900s, many white settlers moved into the outback of New South Wales. The smaller towns grew, and the demand for consumer goods and fresh food increased. White farmers cleared more land of wildlife and brought in herds of cattle and sheep. The farmers pressured the state government to release Aboriginal reserve lands for farming. On the reserves, the Aborigines Protection Board planned to break up the Aboriginal communities and sell off the land. The board began by removing the rights of Aborigines to own and use reserve lands. From now on, Aborigines would own nothing. A lot of the men were very keen on having farms of their own, and they sent a petition to the board asking for land. And they were given uh, so much land down uh, near the river, and they were very enthusiastically cleaning it up and chopping all the trees down, and they uh, planted crops. As a child, I remember that vividly. It was something for us to see, the sweet, which was grown by our own people. Then all of a sudden, the uh, board informed them that they uh, were taking the land back again. And it proved that, you know, Aborigines had no rights whatsoever. And I think, I really think that's what broke the spirit of the men who had done all that work really for nothing. In 1909, the Aborigines Protection Board placed white managers in control of every Aboriginal reserve in New South Wales. The manager was given full powers over the lives of the people living there. The reserves were made a training ground for the Aboriginal children to become servants. The Protection Board's plan was to then remove the children from the reserve and place them under the control of white employers. Once removed, these children would never be allowed 
to return home. Well, the manager lived like uh, uh, people that live in very um, nice homes with plenty of money and and uh, he just got what he wanted. He got his uh, biggest share of the meat and, and milk and everything that was given to the people, they rang a bell for. We got flour, uh, sugar and tea and they also gave fat, which you could smell a mile off when you started to cook it. It was so smelly and our people had to take that. The manager used to keep a pretty tight brain on us. He wasn't a qualified teacher, couldn't teach above third class. Most of our time was spent out working in the gardens or digging trenches, pit toilets, etc. A lot of manual labor instead of being educated. The only thing I learned was how to work. At Hermansburg Mission Station, the children are given a rudimentary education, and when their lessons are over, it is amusing to see them fall out of school just like ants out of an anthill. It was a one room little place. They told me had a desk, four on each side, you know, four on this side, four on that side, and uh, we didn't. Uh, really didn't have any education because most of the time the teacher would be at his place having a cup of tea or be sleeping out on the front veranda. And asking you to take over? And I, I, he used to teach, ask me to teach the children <laughs> and uh, I knew nothing. That I'd be walking around in, in, in front of the class with a cane <laughs> and uh, you know, and they'd say, they'd say to me, oh you think you're somebody great. And I'd give them a whack with the cane for giving me cheek, because I was a teacher. <laughs> and uh, so, and yeah, well, I'm really self-taught, you know. We I, both are, you know. Self-taught. Uh, I never learned all. anything at school. Protection board inspectors travelled to reserves throughout the state to pick out children who had reached the age of 13 and have them sent into the control of white employers. Yes, Mr. Donaldson, we used to call him was the, used to call him the superintendent. He was an inspector. He used to come once a year to the mission. And uh, the parents didn't, didn't want him to know a lot of things. And uh, we'd be warned to be pretty careful in any questions that he asked us, how we'd answer. I remember he used to come out with a great bag full of boy lollies. And uh, after he'd finished speaking to us in the classroom, he would walk to the door, get us all out in the yard and, and throw the lollies out on the ground uh, as if we were fowls, <laughs> feeding fowls. Well, we used to hide in the sugar cane when he came. Well, while we were in the sugar cane, we'd have a good old feed of sugar cane because we had strong teeth then. But he picked uh, uh, he picked the girls he wanted sent away. Then one one day he came on, but it was just after that when Mr. Howard brought a policeman over one Saturday. And they asked my mother, would she agree to send me down to Sydney? He told me that I'd have large, pretty frocks, I'd be going to parties and all that kind of thing, and I knew he was telling lies. I, I, even at that age, I, I wasn't stupid. One day, the, the manager came over to, to, the, to our island, Alagundi Island, and uh, told me that I, I was to go and work for them. And uh, he wasn't living on the island, he was, because it was, uh, there was too much flooding for them. So, uh, Anyway, I went, went along with it because you didn't, well, I mean, you couldn't do anything else. You just had to go. When I got over there, I, I was told I was 
to work for them, and I was only 12 years of age. The children in school used to stand on the desk and look out the window in a motor car. The days of the when we very rarely saw a motor car. And uh, they came for, the officials came for us with a policeman in it. Policeman in the car. And uh, it was a Mrs. Hill that was teaching us, and she sent the boys, two boys, to run like mad must have been about three quarters of a mile over the river, to tell my mother. Anyway, she must have ran all the way back because she still had her apron on. And she put her arms around the three of us and said, you're not taking them. He said, well, I'll have to use this if you don't patting his the case with the handcuffs in it, you know. But we, in our childish imagination, we thought it was a gun. and. Uh, could have both yelled in together, we'll go, we'll go, Mum, we'll go, you know. And, uh, and uh, he was very kind. He tried to be, you know, very kind. And he, my mother said, well, I'm going too. And uh, he still had her apron on and went 25 miles to Daniloquin. And uh, we weren't there very long when the car took us then to Finlay and on the train to Kutamandra. That's a train. Well, my heard years later how my mother cried and cried and she went out. She had nowhere to go. And she went out into the bush and my old aunt and them who were told and they, as they were coming past a certain point right out on the outskirt of Dineloquin, they heard this moaning like an animal, you know, and they stopped the buggy and went over to see and they discovered not that it was my mother lying under this tree and in the tall grass crying. She couldn't mo moaning, she couldn't cry anymore, you know. And uh, they had to care for her and look after her. But we were already on our own, the way or might have been in Kutamandra then, by then, you know, by train. But I often wonder how many other children were taken like that, just like animals, because our hearts were absolutely broken. The younger boys were taken to the Kinchla Training Home for Aborigines, where they were given some training as farm labourers and handymen before being sent out to work on cattle or sheep stations throughout the state. <laughs> 